Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. I'd like to thank uh, John Corbett and the Linux Foundation for getting me here. Wasn't planning on coming, actually. So uh, you probably know me from the buffer blow work. Has anyone ever heard of that? <laughs> has anybody ever, uh, has everybody here fixed it? <laughs> At home, for your neighbor, for your mom. We've got about a billion boxes to upgrade. Um, anyway, so. Uh, well, we just went through this enormous NIC, 200 gig, whatever. Um, this is my copy of the internet. A little home router first developed almost 12, 14 years ago, a little MIPS processor. Does that include all the pawns? I'm sorry, what? Does that include the pawns? Oh. OK, now it does. <laughs> Great, happy? We've got to do a bandwidth test somehow. Uh, anyway. This is like one of the last open source home routers in the world. Almost everything else is binary blobs. Mm -hmm. You can't modify so many things that come off the shelf today. And uh, people keep saying you can't fix the middle boxes. It's the middle boxes that are increasingly the problem in extending IPv6 or IPv4. And this was our last shot at doing so. And uh, despite having enormous success with uh, one thing, fixing buffer blow. We started the Sarawart project with several other goals. We wanted to improve router security, which we did. And we wanted to get IPv6 effectively out into the home. And while we made the world's first IPv6 launch day, and we made OpenWRT much better, all the other middle boxes in the world have been kind of lagging behind that. And I hit a point last year where, well, backstory. I've got plenty of time, don't I? Backstory is uh, Netflix turned off my IPv6 because it was a tunnel and I could no longer get movies anymore. And I had to turn off IPv6 for my entire campus. Yes, sir. You just have to blackball Netflix. That's I, I get it, but I shouldn't have to do that. Okay? So I got a little frustrated. And my friend John Gilmore rung me up right around the same time. And he said that no matter how hard you keep trying to make IPv6 work, you know, we're going to be stuck with IPv4 for roughly forever. How many people here think we're going to be, IPv4 will vanish from the internet in 10 years? No way. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's two optimists in the room. Please check the Kool-Aid that they've been drinking. How about 20? <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. The internet is segmenting into two different portions, IPv6 and IPv4. And uh, that's not necessarily what I wanted to have happen. Which one is, which, which one is bigger in 10 years? IPv6 size or IPv6? It's not size that matters. <laughs> <laughs> it's the motion of the ocean. <laughs> anyway, there was a report that John threw at me uh, from the Internet Governance Group. And it said, legacy IPv4 will coexist with IPv6 indefinitely. And aside from these two characters, does anyone believe that's untrue? We're stuck with it. Even if you've deployed IPv6, you're still going to need IPv4 to connect to the rest of the internet. Does anybody disagree with that? Nope. Now, IPv4 has been kind of this bastard stepchild to the IETF since 1997. Um, you know, we haven't been able to improve it because anytime you want to go improve it, they say, oh, put it in IPv6. And it goes in IPv6 first, and then it comes back to IPv4. So the thought was to take a fresh look at IPv4 and the problems that we have with it today, particularly along the edge and all the connectivity we have, and try to figure out how can we make IPv4 better and also try to get to where we have an IPv6 transition that happens faster. So everybody knows Unicast is a success story of the, Unicast, of the Internet. The, in, large percentage of the traffic is globally routed Unicast. A lot is translated from behind that. We've run out of unicast address space. I mean, Tokyo over there just got us himself a slash 22. Wow. I have a slash 24. I can't use it because my ISP won't route it for me. Um, and uh, all the other kinds of IP4 address spaces are tiny niches. And the current IPv4 address allocation does not reflect that. 
Right now, the night before, before dress costs about 20 bucks each. That's a lot, and they're going to keep going up and up and up and up until hopefully at some point we have enough demand for IPv6 and enough supply for it for it to finally start to fade. But at the moment, I don't see prices going down for the next two or three decades. And some entire countries are behind a single IPv4 address. This is very true. I used to live in Nicaragua. I was behind 13 layers of RFC 1918 to get out of the country. Six million people all behind that level of NAT. No way you can get out. Uh, anyway, long story. Off topic. Anyway, but we still care. Well, we, innovators need addresses. Big incumbents are buying them wholesale, so they won't ever run out. But little companies, they won't be able to get their IP addresses anymore unless they go into the cloud. And it's a barrier to competition. It's all fine if we want internet innovation to stop or be run by monopolists. Land speculators say, buy land. They ain't making more of it. But we can make more IPv4 addresses. It's not hard. It was just a few patches, a spec change, and five to seven years to be able to deploy. So the core people that are involved in the project, we're just tech geeks. We do some protocols. We do policy. We noticed that IPv4 was getting expensive. And we started investigating what it would take to make more. And this is a moonshot talk because it turns out the technology to actually make more IPv4 addresses is quite trivial. But the politics and the long tail of deployment are very long and very difficult. But it's not a Linux issue. It's not a BSD issue. It's not a Windows issue. It's a protocol issue. So John Gilmore, everybody know who John is? Yes. Founder of the EFF. I think he did some work with you on the Spark stuff, didn't he, David? Yeah, yes, John used, to run around, uh... John used to run around naked at the Sun offices when he was working. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yes, Maze. It's not a protocol issue. It's a, it's a hardware and an administrative issue. OK. Yeah, or firmware, if you like. There's many of other issues out there. You want to say that again to the mic? It's not a protocol issue. It's a hardware and administrative issue. OK. Um, so is the IPv6 rollout. Yes. Yes. So anyway, John was responsible for BootB. Anybody ever use that? Yes. And DHCP. Uh, I'm going to get to uh, the cool, cool bug that we fixed related to that. And uh, he did the EFF. And me, I, uh, well, everyone's heard of FQ Cottle, which is primarily Eric's innovation over there. But I'm the guy that kicked Apple and IATF into adopting it almost universally worldwide. Uh, I also ran the Make Wi-Fi Fast projects and Sarah Ward and recently Sked Cake. And Paul Voiders, who's not here, uh, does IPvSec, et cetera, for uh, that. So I wanted to quote a little bit from Carl Arbach. Does anyone know who Carl Arbach was? Uh, ancient prehistory. Remember the very first internet election worldwide for the ICANN board in 1999. He was the independent director elected worldwide who uh, Fought really hard for a free and open internet, and mostly lost. But he's still there. And he once said, the internet is not finished. It's just an experiment. It's a success disaster. It arose from the contributions of many, many people. There were no singular geniuses. There was no, rather, the internet is a collage of many minds. There was no grand plan. Does anyone here think there was a grand plan? No. You know, it could have evolved into something quite different than it is today. I had hoped it would evolve into something that was quite different than it is today. I still like to get my email at home. You know, oops. Um, so there are no deities. It's much more than the World Wide Web. Government initiatives can also produce great things. The Internet's not finished. And there's much left to be created. Wi-Fi is 21 years old. Cell phones are, as we know them, and smartphones are about 12, 11 years old. Um, we have a long way to go before the internet fades away. Carl Arbach. So in talking about what we're going to try to do, or what we've been <clears throat> trying to create some adversity, uh, controversy while doing, is that going back in time when we had IPv4 laid out in the late, in the late 
1979, we had Class A, Class B, and Class C addresses. Who remembers those? Yay, good, I'm not so great. Now we call them slash 8, slash 16, and slash 24s. 0 slash 8 was find my network number in 1984, but that didn't work on LANs. LANs were new then. Uh, so they retired that in 1989, RFC 1122, and was replaced by boot P and DHCP. 127 slash 8, 16 million addresses for loopback. Class A address. Multicast. Who here uses multicast? Everyone uses a little multicast, but not a lot. We laid out 260 million addresses for multicast, thinking we we're going to actually use it for broadcast television, which never happened. Um, so in 1992, we replaced uh, class A, B, and C concepts with something called CIDR. It took years and years to uh, deploy, about eight years really before it became stable. Um, and routing was never the same since. <sighs> Very true. And, uh, and we had to change, at the time, every single internet node on every single operating system. It took a while. But we got the core done in that amount of time. Worked pretty good. 224, everyone was in love with for multicast, but it never scaled like unicast. It's had so many insoluble problems. Yes, Mace? I, I think it's worth pointing out that for the switch over from, from classful to classless, you only actually have to fix the edge of the network. You don't have to fix the core of the network to make use of it. That's a reasonable point, but you still needed to be able to get... All right, I'll, I'll let that point stick. Did somebody else have their hand up just now? No? Okay. So we went looking... Oh, go ahead, sir. Pass the mic. David Woodhouse? I, we're, Woodhouse had... A, Mr. Woodhouse had his hands up. Oh. <laughs> I was just going to say to the last comment, except when that wasn't true, because intermediate routers would drop things that end with dot two to five five, et cetera. So there were issues in the core sometimes. Zero and 255 were problematic going a long way back, period. And, Anything uh, ending with dot, dot 255. Yeah. So uh, oh, 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 back and forth we go. I've, I've actually seen zero be problematic even recently because it was, you know, zero terminated strings. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, vey. All right, don't go okay for time? Okay. So I only have a couple more slides, and then I can talk about um, earlier, before the talk, I distributed some questions to the audience, and I'm going to read off some of the answers. So how do we make new IPv4 addresses? We make a small spec change. We make a couple small patches to kernels and user spaces. We do a set of test beds and iterate the above till it all works, and only then tackle the politics as to how to allocate them. Running code first. Rough consensus screwed it up 10 years ago. You were there for that. Um, anyway, so there's a bunch of things that were reserved for future use. 240 slash 4, 10 plus years ago, was all the rage. Yes, we'll find some way of using up 260 million new IP addresses. We needed them bad, and instead of uh, actually finishing the RFCs for it, all the operating systems, except Windows, adopted support for it, and yet we were never able to allocate them. Uh, last uh, landed an it fix for that in December, and the patches are available for BSD. Then we had 0 slash 8, global unicast. Never used except for 0.0.0. .0. That was the bug that John Gilmore had fixed with DHCP in 1986, I think it was. 30, this is a 33-year-old bug in the specification for IPv4. So just recently, Dave accepted the patch for 0 .0 0.0.0, and we're trying to get it elsewhere. Now, <clears throat> to really stir up the mix, we talked about localhost. How many addresses do people use out of the 127 range today? Is it more than one? Yes. How many? It's two? I hear I, five? I see five. Ten? OK, so 10 out of 16 million is what? <laughs> It's more than 10, but I believe it's, it's less than 16 million. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so recently I put out what I'd hoped would be a somewhat controversial patch fixing that. Uh, we reduced it to a slash 16. 64,000 addresses reserved for localhost. Now, ideally, I don't know how to use them. All I know is that, hey, we got 15 million 900, and you know, we'll figure out what to do with them later. The same thing goes for 224 slash 4. 
Um, we ended up allocating stuff at the bottom part of the range, 224 slash 8, and at the top part of the range, 239 slash 8. There's some weirdnesses in the multicast ranges for uh, 232 and up, but 225 through 231 were reserved for future use back in 1989 and never used. And we scanned all the source code in the world and we couldn't find anybody using them. Okay, all of open source code that we could find. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, well-known... Um, go ahead, go ahead, Maze. So there's, there's a well-known and published uh, hack standard, whatever you want to call it, where IPv6 gets coalesced into 224 slash 3. Yeah, where is that referenced? I don't know, but it's, it's been, I mean, Lorenzo has, has talked about it, you know, even a half a decade ago, if not longer ago, at, at various talks. Yeah. And I know... Uh, I know we use that extensively internally, and I'm pretty sure other people have. I don't know. There's someone from Cloudflare. Anybody else using 220, 225 and up? Going once. Going, going twice. twice. <laughs> Google only. <laughs> Google only. 120 plus million IP addresses possibly used for that by Google. Mm. Actually, half a, half a billion. The whole smear. <laughs> uh, but it would be cool to. Go ahead. Sure. I'm aware of a couple of products that use the 127 range. Okay. So it's all internal. I mean, uh, you're not going to find that by doing a search of, you know, open source code, of course. Part of it is a shake in the tree, see what falls out. <laughs> okay. And uh, we, we did reserve the bottom part of it, and if somebody, you know, it, it, shake the tree, see what happens. Sure. And Linux for a long time has said anything under 127.8 is local, and it will it'll accept connections for it. Yeah. So anyway, this was the patch for zero. People were going around saying, oh, this is going to be so hard to roll out. That was the total patch. I actually saved a nanosecond while doing that one. Arguably, should rename the function, but I had touched 22 files to do that. And I didn't know David would take it. <laughs> so I pe left pe that. Pe people sent me angry cat pictures on Twitter after I applied that patch. Well, it got good play on, on Reddit, too, and other places. And, uh, you know, it was life. So anyway, how, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> kind of kind of situation. <laughs> well, anyway, we do want to work on making the zeroth address work better. You know, there's only a couple user space tools to check for it. There's a couple other bugs throughout the system. Um, we want to be able to get, um, I forget which RFC, RFC 30, 3021. We want ISPs to be able to use up more addresses than they have for IPv4 since we're squeezing them. And there's innumerable other things we could do to make IPv4 a little bit better including a, f a few that I am totally scared to put on tape. You can see me at lunch. So um, my little group has been landing patches and testing, doing interrupt. Uh, plan is to uh, put up a periscope, um, in, in telescope, whatever you call it, um, to look at backscatter uh, for it, to start trying to interoperate with zero, zero possibly as a starter rather than 240, and uh, go on build up to what we can possibly get to where we can do globally routable these addresses. Many people have come up to me, dozens of people have come to me now and say, well, it's totally okay, we can add this to RFC 1918 space. And I'm like, but can't we try? to make it globally routable? Don't you want an IPv4 address for everybody? And they go, oh, it's got to be, no, can we try? And first up, they have to be routable for that to happen. Yeah. Anyway, um, it turned out in our research is that um, multiple SDNs and pieces of software that did stuff in user space actually weren't doing any checking at all. AWS, pure unicast space. And that was, uh, pretty much the defining thing. I said, well, we should go ahead and try to do this. So um, it's implemented now. Uh, zero, I think zero and 240 are out on OpenWRT. And we hope that from there, over the course of multiple years, we'll try to make a better IPv4 internet. Last thing up, I have a whole bunch of people that had given me suggestions, but I thought I'd take a couple quick questions first. Yeah, did anyone have any questions on the uh, address extensions and allocating more IPv4 addresses to the public? So for 127, I know people have used various high values of 127, never using like a lot of addresses, but just using random numbers out of 127. So they stayed away from loopback's address. 
as far as possible. <laughs> no, so, so for example, I know that we coalesce colon colon one into 127.666. I see. Okay, good to know. So that's a conflict with reducing the size of 127. Um, I know that for 224 and up, there's the coalesce all IPv6 space in order to get something that's parsable by IPv4 tools. So basically hash IPv6 space into that. Um, and I know also that people have been using uh, the 240 space as RFC 1918 space for a while now. Uh, um, why didn't they just use the U.S. government's military or whatever? I, I did make that suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, even, I even mentioned that 11 slash 8 is CIA and it's right next to 10 slash 8. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's unused. But... Uh, <laughs> Okay. All right. My meta, my meta point, though, is that, so going back to this thing, I've worked on IPv6 my whole life, and I really want to see IPv6 succeed. And there's a lot of work that needs to get done to make IPv6 better. And uh, I wanted to list off some of the things people suggested. Has anyone here ever heard of RFC 7368? That's your homework assignment. Go look in that one up. RFC 7368. Ideally, that's how we get more IPv6 into small home networks and small office spaces and out of the data center along the edge. Uh, who here uses Android? How many of you tether via Android? How many of you would like to have IPv6 via your tether via Android? So there's an RFC 6653. It hasn't been implemented yet. Somebody should go do that. Anyone here ever heard of source-specific routing? Woohoo! Uh, that's a method of having multiple homing, at, so you can have more than one provider. Or in the case of a cell phone, you can have your multi-path TCP actually work between two different connections. Not implemented very many places, and uh, it needs to be implemented for IPv6 RA. And I have a couple more suggestions here. The next suggestion: What would you do to make IPv6 more deployable? Break IPv4. Or at least add features to IPv6, but not four. Okay. There's a question. Why would I deploy a 20-year-old technology? Well, I have to answer that one because it works. <laughs> um, get Ele all the electricity is a little bit older. We still deploy that, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just kept a couple other ones. Um, get all the ISPs to implement it. Yeah, I think that's the big one for me. To me, we found her on bureaucracy and inertia. Lousy uh, profit margins, low demand from customers. To me, we have to get out there and march and complain. You know, I want my IPv6. Mm -hmm. uh, I, want my, I want my email to come back to my home. Uh, we need to, to improve our pol uh, political thing here. Uh, I can't read that one here, that one here. And um, upgrade everything. Um, I got to admit that I, you know, in doing this one, I really hope that we would see the upgrade cycle get better, not just for IPv6 support, but to fix this, what was the B word? Not blockchain, no, it was, oh yeah, buffer bloat, yeah. And uh, I was sad to see this, this network here is buffer bloated. Uh, but uh, this, that whole thing would have been nice to fix from the perspective of the kind of problems we see with IoT, which is like lack of support, lack of upgradability means vulnerability. Yes. So OTA, OTA should be bloody mandatory. Absolutely. Like, Simil like legally, there should be some legal protection for consumers that you can't just disappear and not have your stuff yeah. upgraded. So several years ago, in order to be able to deliver this, you probably were around. I had to go to war. We went to war, Toki and I, or the FCC just so we could reflash our own routers. The fight for the right to reflash our own routers. And I don't want to have to fight like that. It should be obvious at this point that the edge of the network is insecure and it needs to be continuously upgraded. The thing is, like, if you say to someone, hey, you buy this car, you can only change the tires at the vendor's garage. They're like, no, that, that's, that's ridiculous. I should be able to put tires anywhere. But if you use the technology example, they're like, oh, I don't understand why that's so important. Hey, <laughs> right. Well, that, that is the classic example, the John Deere example. But somehow, I'm a, I'm a peripherally involved with the European wireless, what was it called? The wireless directive? Radio directive. Radio directive. With the FSFE. You know, they're trying to lock down the routers. 
Um, in case of Broadcom, can I go pick on Broadcom and their wireless <laughs> stuff? You know, I would like us to make a <laughs> And he's looking around. I would like us to make a really strong point that binary blobs are insecure, they're dangerous, and they're buggy, and somehow we have to make work much harder within the Linux Foundation and elsewhere to, to get make sure the regulatory agencies understand that. One of the things that really bugged me about the whole um, Volkswagen crisis, not once, that, the diesel scandal, $28 billion in fines, not once was the remedy being open sourced your bloody drivers because they would never have been tempted to lie about their emissions. But the other element to this is I may not want to become an auto mechanic, but I would like to choose the auto mechanic who can fix my car. Groovy. So I hope that in the coming years we do a better job of, and the only way I feel we can upgrade all the metal boxes is to do a better job of working on making them open source and you keep plugging away. So, any more questions? Are we good? Thank you all for letting Thank me Thank you very much, David. That was great.